Hi everyone, welcome to week nine. And this week, you notice in the readings, I present you with a lot of readings by Luther Gulick. Luther Gulick uh, is really uh, a leader in what was called the Administrative Management School of Public Administration. Um, Luther Gulick was very influential, as it turns out, in the Franklin D. Roosevelt White House, as we, you know, as we call it, the, the New Deal White House. And of course, FDR is known for really increasing the power of the presidency, but this didn't occur in a vacuum. It wasn't as if uh, FDR somehow did this without, uh, you know, in secret, without Congress knowing it. Congress actually was a willing participant, as we'll see. Um, but Luther Gulick served on a, a group called the Brownlow Committee. And the Brownlow Committee really was responsible for developing a lot of the structure of the expansion of the executive office of the president. So really what I want to talk about this week uh, and with your readings and with your discussion uh, from the public administration standpoint is what what does this have to do with administration? Well, what it has to do with administration uh, is is this if you look at the kettle reading that you're assigned kettle chapter five the executive branch that kettle describes in chapter five is really much more complex than the executive department envisioned in the constitution i mean you can make the argument that hamilton at least and and madison as well expected the executive and uh, probably the Congress to expand and to grow into the Constitution, that argument can legitimately be made. But even if you say that, um, you have to agree that the executive department envisioned by the founders really was a lot smaller than, than what we know today uh, in our current time, and really was a lot smaller than the uh, executive office of the president that, that really came to be during the administration of Franklin D. Roosevelt. And so I want to talk about this impact of Gulick and Brownlow um, and the ongoing, really, executive legislative tensions in our constitutional framework. We can even see this today, right? Um, and this applies at every level, really, of our federalist system. You know, even at the state level, we see tension between the governor and the legislature. We see tension between elected mayors and elected councils in various cities in the United States. And really, this kind of tension is, is partially built in to our constitutional understanding of separation of powers. So I want us to take some time this week to think about how uh, this came to be during the 1930s and, and see how that affects us today. So first of all, Luther Gulick. So Luther Gulick wrote about the theory of administration. As I said, he was one of the leaders of what is called the Administrative Management School of Public Administration. Um, Luther came up with uh, this acronym called POSDICORP, which we've probably touched on before. I'm gonna to touch on it again later on here, but Luther believed very much in uh, an organized bureaucracy. He felt that uh, in any executive agency, uh, there should be division of labor by skill and task. He believed in functional departments by task group, for example, the typing department. Um, and he believed that there were limits on the division of labor. So in other words, you, you could actually divide labor too much. Um, you could end up sub-optimizing by subdividing uh, one full-time task. Um, you could divide labor where technology and custom define the task of the worker um, anyway. Um, you could do physical subdivision, um, but you shouldn't do organic subdivision. So what he meant by that was that you can, you can subdivide workers physically, but you really shouldn't subdivide them if, if you're actually subdividing the synergy that they have together. Um, but through all that sub that division of labor, I should say, he really strongly believed in coordination of effort. So 
coordination is required because divisional labor does by itself create confusion and poor communication. And so again here, Gulick's answer was proper organization. Let's move into a little more of what Gulick was talking about. So um, what Gulick believed was that an ideal organization should establish a system of authority. That is, there's a single directing authority, but uh, there are other authorities below that directing authority. So that single directing authority defines the task to be done, um, appoints a director, determines how to subdivide tasks, and establishes the structure of authority between the director and the workers to enable coordination. So what does all that mean? What all that means is before uh, anyone even issues the check to the client, for example, the organization is completely set up and thought through. And so the administrative uh, management school of thought really believed that what mattered most was the way you organized. Um, so span of control is very important in this organization. There isn't a magic number and it varies by the work, but, but really, as you read this slide, think of this, you know, some of the ideas we get to are things like, you know, an ideal span of control is three to six workers per supervisor. Um, and we still, we still use these kinds of rules of thumb in organizations that we're part of. Um, unity of command is essential in organizations. That is that outside organizations will coordinate with you, but they will not command you. Um, and that executives and directors are, are specialized in functional areas. And so Gulick came up with this idea of POSDICORB to really say what executives were supposed to do. So POSDICORB stands for planning, organizing, staffing, directing, coordinating, reporting, and budgeting. So the idea is, if, if the question is, what does an executive do? This is what an executive does. These tasks under POSDICORP, planning, organizing, staffing, directing, coordinating, reporting, and budgeting. So no matter what your particular bureaucracy happens to be, you're going to be involved in these activities. And every executive will be involved in these activities. And so take a minute, uh, you might put this on pause or whatever, to look at those and understand what Gulick's talking about, because it's going to relate to his later work having to do with the executive office of the president. Gulick, um, one of his strongest emphases was the enhancement of executive power, both within a particular organization and among the organizations of the executive branch. That is the executive branch of the president of the United States. Um, Gulick said, neither the public nor the legislature is capable of the planning needed by effective government. So if the goal is effective government, Gulick's idea is that the executive, that is the president, plans for what should logically happen in government. In other words, the executive is in charge of strategic planning. So where does that leave the, the legislature? Where that leaves the legislature is actually as a veto point. Um, it's up to the legislature to see what the president's plans are and really and truly second guess the president, um, not, not all the time, but perhaps second guess and adjust what the executive says. Um, and so this idea for Gulick is that the ideal government is one in which the chief executive supported by special staffs draws the plans, the legislature accepts or rejects proposed policies. And so Gulick became part of uh, a special commission that was formed in the Roosevelt administration called the Brownlow Committee, uh, consisted of Lewis Brownlow, Charles Merriam, and Luther Gulick, to make recommendations for how the presidency should be organized. And so remember, this is in the 1930s. We, you know, the country is already 150 years old, but um, <clears throat> now Gulick and his cohorts are reorganizing the executive. So here's what Gulick said about executive power, and he's talking about executive power in government. 
that the government does play a positive role in society, uh, especially acting in the case of market failure. Um, but there should be public-private partnership, basically. He says that the executive branch at all levels of government, and that would be at the state level as well, and even at the city level, proposes and implements policies, while the legislature should be uh, limited to approval or rejection of executive proposals. He believed that the chief executive office should be strengthened through improved staff support. Uh, so basically what Gulick is saying is that the sparse presidency envisioned in the constitution was really no longer useful. Um, he believed that better collaboration between levels of government should be strived for. That is, the legislature and the executive should cooperate and collaborate more than they uh, fight with each other. Um, he believed that administrators are necessary and they are in, involved in political and policy matters. They are necessarily involved in those matters. Um, and so this idea that there's a politics administrative dichotomy, really, Gulick adjusts that. Uh, he, he doesn't believe that that's really the case. Um, he says scientific methods should be employed to understand general principles of administration. So you remember scientific management from Taylor um, and that top leaders in executive branch organizations should coordinate and integrate activities to achieve unity of purpose. So you can really see how Gulick really is borrowing from Weber and from, from Taylor to form his thinking on how the executive branch should operate. So there was this committee called the Brownlow Committee, which I talked about uh, the members of the Brownlow Committee a couple of slides ago. Um, go down to the very last bullet there. Uh, it says that an act enabled FDR to submit reorganization plans, the most significant of which was the executive office of the president under what was called reorganization plan number one. So I'll go back to the top of the slide where I say Brownlow and the Reorganization Act of 1939. The Brownlow committee proposed all of these things, that the White House staff had to be expanded, that the managerial agencies in the executive department um, particularly those that dealt with things like budget and personnel should be strengthened. That the merit system, uh, that is the civil service system, should be extended in the executive office of the president so that the best talent could work in government service. And that the entire executive branch of government should be overhauled and reduced to a few large departments. Okay. Here's how the Brownlow Committee and the Reorganization Act of 1939 connect with each other. The Brownlow Committee issued its report to Congress. Congress passed the, Re the Reorganization Act of 1939. There is a bit of a misunderstanding uh, about what happened in 1939. Um, yes, it is very true that the power and the scope of the presidency under the four administrations of Franklin Roosevelt did expand. Um, what's not true is that Roosevelt somehow did this in an underhanded way, uh, in a way that undercut the power of Congress. Congress was in on the action. Um, Congress passed an act to reorganize the White House as a branch of government. So what does that say? Well, what it says really is that Congress here in 1939, uh, 150 years after the founding of the country and the Constitution, was basically saying the small presidency is no longer adequate. Um, and Congress said the executive needs to do at least some of the things that Gulick said the executive should be doing. That is being the leading branch in government, if you will. That doesn't mean that the tension between the legislative branch and the executive branch ended there, because it certainly didn't, as we're going to go forward and see in the next few slides. So this is the executive office of the president approximately currently. And if you look at that, um, that document that I asked you to read, 
from the Congressional Research Service. It talks about some of these agencies. But what I want you to look at is all the various things that uh, are part of the Executive Office of the President. And also look at uh, the offices that require confirmation by the Senate and the ones that don't require confirmation by the Senate. Uh, of course, the second line down, and maybe I should head that first, is the office of the vice president. There's, there's a large office of the vice president with some of the same kinds of officers serving in the vice president staff. Um, but look who requires confirmation and who doesn't. Of course, the chief of staff to the president doesn't require uh, Senate confirmation, although arguably some chiefs of staff have been the second most powerful person in government, really. Um, more powerful than the vice president in many cases. Um, look at the ones who do require confirmation. The Office of Management and Budget, who is the really the budget coordination office for the executive branch. D that requires confirmation. Uh, the Office of the United States Trade Representative requires confirmation. Um, there are offices that don't require confirmation. And you can see those there. And you could probably notice that some of those offices might not might not directly affect policy but they might uh, and so what's really important though to notice is that the executive office of the president is a large branch of government it's not a few people uh, acting as personal advisors to the president it's a very large branch of government doing a lot of policy work So what's that conflict with? Well, really what it conflicts with is kind of this constitutional view of Congress and of the president. This is, uh, we've talked about this, this is the constitutional view of Congress. Um, if all you read is the constitution, this is what you know about Congress. The vice president is a non-voting member of the Senate. The vice president is simultaneously a member of the Senate and the executive. John Adams, the first vice president, didn't happen to like sitting in the Senate chamber, and so he didn't do it very often. The question is, what would have happened precedent-wise if John Adams had decided that that was the most important job in government and decided to become something like the president of the Senate, which is what that position is, uh, and speak on behalf of the Senate to the president? what would have become of the relationship between the Senate and the president? It might have been totally different. Um, so the constitutional view of Congress is that the Senate was selected, not elected, by state legislatures. Only one branch was elected by the people and the, the franchise itself was very limited. However, uh, really, <laughs> that was the only branch of the, the national government that was elected, the House of Representatives. And so the, the Congress had the power to tax, the power to borrow, the power to coin money, the power to declare war, the power to fund the military, but only on two-year appropriations, the power to establish the laws that govern the military, and the power to make laws that are necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers, that is, of the whole Constitution. Um, so the necessary and proper clause actually has been the hanger for all kinds of acts of Congress over the past 240 years. So that's the constitutional view of Congress. This is the constitutional view of the presidency, and this is the view that really was taken to task by the Brownlow Committee and the Reorganization Act of 1939. Executive power was vested in a president of the United States. The president was indirectly elected, um, chosen by states, with state discretion on method. The president was the commander in chief of the army and the navy and the militia. And the part that everybody forgets about was what the constitution says was when called into actual service of the United States. Um, and my argument is that the way the constitution is written, uh, the military belonged to the Congress. The, the Congress made the laws for the military. The president did become the commander in chief when called into actual service of the United States. Um, that changed. It didn't just change in the last uh, 50 or 70 years. It, it changed uh, over time. Uh, 
Um, but uh, you know that quite often in the media, the president is referred to as the commander in chief. My opinion again is that's really a misappropriation of the term. Um, that wasn't a term that you would have heard the founders using to describe the president unless we were fighting a war. Um, and yes, the, the president does have power to make treaties with the advice and consent of the Senate. The president does have the power to appoint officers with the advice and, and consent of the Senate. Um, the president from time to time must give Congress information on the State of the Union, which is an interesting wording from time to time. And most early presidents did that by writing a letter. There wasn't the State of the Union address as we know it now, the pageantry, there wasn't any of that. It was a letter from the president to the Congress. Um, unbelievably, the president has the power to convene and adjourn Congress. It's never been used. Um, the, there is no requirement in the Constitution for the president to submit an executive budget. Um, prior to 1920, each department submitted a budget to the Congress without necessarily coordination from the president. Um, there was, there is no ability of the president to declare war unilaterally without the Congress. And this is the constitutional view of the presidency. And so we've read this, and so this is just a review, but Federalist 51 said that ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Um, what were Hamilton and Madison talking about there? Well, they were talking about the relationship between the executive and the legislative and between the central government and the states. Um, so in a republic, the legislative authority necessarily predominates. This is what was said in the Federalist Papers. That is, the executive was seen as a weak branch, having only a veto power. Was the question is, is that still true? Um, so the government was to be federal though this certainly means more than three levels of government um, because it was interlocking. So again, in the constitution, the Senate represented the states, not the people. So if you can separate the interests of the people in the states against the interest of the state itself, that's what the Senate was about. And so there's an argument, uh, an argument that actually I make um, that when this, the amendment was passed to allow direct election of senators, that probably could have been the time when uh, the abolition of the Electoral College could be considered. Um, why do I say that? I say that because the election of the president really was in the Constitution something of a contest of preference between the states themselves, not the people at large, but between the states themselves. Well, right here, I'd like to switch gears a little bit, um, and I'd like to talk about this idea that the presidency really became the preeminent branch of government. And one of the ways I think this happened was through what I call the famous or recent president syndrome. And my proposition is that we remember these people as famous presidents because, um, mostly because they expanded the power of the presidency vis-a-vis -vis the Congress. Um, and the question is, if they had not done that, would the presidency have really been the dominant branch? So for example, I have a few examples. Um, if John Adams had taken an interest in being what is called the president of the Senate in his role as first vice president, uh, would he have actually expanded the role of the, that position in the Senate and possibly created a position that by precedent would have become something like the prime minister. We'll never know. Uh, the election of 1800, if Jefferson had not ultimately won on the 35th ballot in uh, the House of Representatives, defeating his uh, putative running mate, Aaron Burr, um, would the 12th Amendment have resulted? If the 12th Amendment hadn't happened, we wouldn't have elections the way we have them now with a, a uh, ticket of president and vice presidential candidate. Jefferson, really without much consultation from the Senate, purchased Louisiana, doubling the size of the, the uh, 
United States, President Jackson, who I say in the next bullet later came is credited with coming up with the spoil system, actually signed an act called the Indian Removal Act. But the Indian Removal Act had been really part of his legislative agenda for a long time, which was removing Indian tribes from what was the constituted or the settled United States at that time to west of the Mississippi. Um, Lincoln, the president who's probably arguably the most admired president, suspended the writ of habeas corpus. Uh, effectively, he kept Maryland in the Union during the Civil War through um, martial law for a time. He, he famously issued the Emancipation Proclamation. However, it's important to remember the Emancipation Proclamation really did not, after the war, free the slaves. That required an amendment to the Constitution. The Emancipation Proclamation was really a military order as in his role as commander in chief, and it really only applied to the states in rebellion. Theodore Roosevelt did sign the National Parks Law, but he also established uh, many set-asides through uh, his power as president, declaring numerous national monuments. And this list can go on. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt famously expanded the office of the president, as we've talked about. Um, Truman actually issued an executive order in 1950 integrating the armed forces. Um, Congress wasn't going to do that at the time anyway, and Truman did it through executive order. Eisenhower and Kennedy uh, sent advisors to Vietnam. This is after Truman had fought an undeclared war in Korea. And these advisors, of course, later bloomed into a full-fledged military force in Vietnam. Presidents Johnson and Nixon continued to fight an undeclared war in Vietnam. Uh, at the end of that, Congress passed the War Powers Act to limit the war-making power of the president. Uh, president Nixon innovated this idea of impounding appropriations, and Congress passed a law in 1974, again, to try to stop the president from doing that. Um, and President Reagan, Bush Sr., Clinton, Bush Jr., President Obama, and now President Trump, really, we're all fighting uh, wars, undeclared wars, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Serbia, Bosnia, Kosovo, Panama, Grenada, other places. Um, and this is really mostly done through the power of the presidency. And President Trump himself now is currently a leader, not the leader, in <coughs> executive orders per year compared to his immediate predecessors anyway. So one uh, act of Congress that actually enabled the presidency is called the authorization, authorization of the use of military force. And this was passed in the wake of 9-11. Um, and you can see all the whereases there. These are the whereases that Congress put in the act. Um, and in the wake of 9-11, Congress said, we can't really declare a war. We, we don't have a state that we're fighting, and, but we want to authorize the president to do something. And as you read all these whereases, what you should know, uh, whenever you read those kinds of clauses, that's going to lead to something. And the next slide is the something that this leads to. Uh, in bold print there, the, the authorization for the use of military force uh, immediately following 9-11 says this, that the president is authorized to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11th, 2001, or harbored such organizations or persons in order to prevent any future acts of international terrorism against the United States by such nations, organizations, or persons. Well, um, <laughs> The Bush administration used this actually to go to war in Afghanistan and then later to go to war in Iraq. Uh, the Obama administration used this authorization to continue those wars uh, and to the Obama administration in particular used this authorization to engage in its strategy of targeted uh, drone strikes against individuals. Um, and the Trump administration is continuing to use this authorization for the use of military force, although Congress is talking about either renewing it, this or changing it. But the point is, it really um, 
is not necessarily what the founders had in mind. And so the point that if we say the presidency has become the dominant branch and and the founders really didn't necessarily design it that way, my point is that Congress has helped the presidency become the stronger branch. Congress has basically been in on the act. Um, the Budget and Accounting Act of 1921 created the first true presidential budget and the Bureau of the Budget, which we now call the OMB. And really what that did was it, in a sense, limited the power of Congress. It, it meant that the president passed, or not passed, but presented a unified budget to Congress, um, which is more convenient probably for everybody involved, but it also means that Congress uh, is accepting, in a sense, the strategic plan of the president, even though Congress does have the power to change the budget, and it does. Um, in 1974, Congress passed this act in response to President Nixon's impoundment of appropriated funds. Um, and so that was actually taking back a little ground on the budget. The Reorganization Act, as we talked about in 1939, was created by Congress and established the Executive Office of the President, ultimately. The Administrative Procedures Act of 1946 established regulation and rulemaking uh, within executive agencies. So that's important to keep in mind because really uh, a lot of people talk about the power of agencies to pass regulations as if these agencies do they do this regulation making on their own accord without any input from Congress. That's really not the, the case. Congress is involved in this. The regulation and rules process is a is a public process. Um, and the administration Administrative Procedures Act really is the act that enabled this. Um, the National Security Act, which I like to talk about, established the Department of Defense. Um, really, the founders established a separate Navy and a separate Army for a reason. Um, and what was that reason? There's a lot of speculation, on, but part of that reason might have been they really didn't want the Army and Navy colluding together. Um, well, um, post-World War II, um, the United States saw the benefits of joint, a joint military force, if you will, um, and so established the Department of Defense. Um, another Reorganization Act in 1949 um, expanded the Executive Office of the President and the AUMF, which I just talked about. Right now, a lot of members of Congress are talking about rewriting it. Who knows what will come out? Here I want to switch gears a little bit again and talk about signing statements and executive orders, because executive orders are a hot topic um, because President Trump has signed a lot of executive orders. He's not the first president to do so. Um, presidents throughout history have used signing statements where they sign a law, but per, but in writing express some of their reservations about the law. Um, is that a constitutional practice? Again, it's it's allowed, but there is an opinion that it might not be a constitutional practice. I have two charts here, two or three, that talk about the number of executive orders that presidents have signed. And so you can see, if you go all the way back to George Washington, he signed eight executive orders. John Adams only signed one in one term. Um, Thomas Jefferson signed four. James Madison, the father of the Constitution, as he's called, signed one executive order. And so executive orders were not into vogue during the, the first several decades of the Republic and the presidency. But in the late 1800s and early 1900s, executive orders started to be used more and more by presidents. You can see that Theodore Roosevelt on the, on the chart on the right signed a total of over a thousand executive orders. Franklin Roosevelt, of course, signed um, 3,700 executive orders. Will anyone top that? Uh, probably not, we don't know. But you can see that executive orders became in vogue much more in the late 20th century and now in the early 21st century. And here's the number of executive orders that were signed by George Bush, Bill Clinton, the George Bush Jr., Barack Obama, and Donald Trump. 
this chart shows um, really where the Trump presidency is at with executive orders right now. This was really through um, this chart is through the end of April of 2017. But President Trump has signed 45 executive orders through August 28th. So there's really more than that by now. Um, but he is on pace uh, to have more executive orders per year than any of his immediate predecessors there. And what does all that mean for the power of the presidency? Um, that question aside, Congress does continue to have a lot of power when it comes to the budget. And this is probably, I would argue, one of the most important powers of Congress. This chart and the next chart show um, what Congress has done with budgets uh, compared to presidents. So there's a zero right in the middle of this graph, and that would represent a balance. That would mean that Congress went along with the president's budget exactly. Um, or if it's above zero, that means Congress put more money in the budget than the president wanted. If it's below zero, that means Congress put less money in the budget than the president wanted. So you see at various times, um, the Truman administration, um, later years of the Nixon administration, uh, even in the Reagan administration, Congress actually put more money in the budget than the president wanted put in the budget. This shows this from a slightly different perspective, and it talks about defense and non-defense. And so you can see that on defense, uh, Congress actually during the Truman administration put more money in the budget than President Truman wanted, which is interesting. I want to contrast that to the Nixon years and then the late Nixon years and what really became the Nixon Ford years. Congress put a heck of a lot more money in non-defense than President Nixon and then President Ford wanted and a lot less money in defense than President Nixon and pre later President Ford wanted. And interestingly, you know, you should watch the the Ken Burns series on Vietnam and what you learn by the closing episodes is that as South Vietnam was falling uh, militarily to North Vietnam, the United States had already pulled out. President Ford wanted money to provide to South Vietnam and Congress refused it. Um, this, this is actually a very divisive time. So uh, defense was not funded to the level that the presidents wanted and domestic programs even though the president didn't want them funded as high, they were funded higher. That same kind of thing really shows up in the Reagan administration. So um, interestingly enough, in the Clinton administration, uh, Congress decremented the Clinton's, uh, the Clinton budget packages by about, you know, $24 billion compared to what he wanted on non-defense areas. Okay, so the question of so what should really pop into your mind by this time watching this whole lecture. Um, and this is the so what. The so what is the Constitution was designed not for efficiency, really, but to check ambition through a method of separation of powers. Um, and really, to, a very, to various degrees, our state constitutions in the United States and city charters kind of have the same feature in them. Um, not efficiency, but separation of powers. And so that idea led Wilson to think, and we read Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, thought the Constitution was problematic and inefficient because it inhibited smooth administration. He said as much. Um, during the progressive era, some progressives thought that city charters could be much more administratively viable if cities were reformed, essentially by removing uh, separation of powers. So reform cities, the, the city manager form actually has a council. The only elected body is the council who hires an executive, if you will, but oversees uh, that city manager as a hired employee. Effectively, really having a council that is both executive and legislative. Um, you, I had to read Rohr and Spicer and Terry and Stivers and to some degree, they all talked about, you know, what would it be like if administration had some degree of independence or should administration have some degree of independence? Um, 
And this goes really to the heart of arguing about separation of powers. And in a few weeks, we'll talk about new public management and see that um, reformers in the 1990s, one of the things they were wanting to reform was the inefficiency of bureaucratic government. Really, um, in a sense, they were talking about inefficiency of separation of powers. Um, and this continues to pop up when people run for office and say they want to run government like a business. What they're really talking about is being more efficient. That's the idea. But one of the ways to be efficient is actually to remove separation of powers. And so the question is, when people say our government is inefficient or governments in general are inefficient, it'd be interesting to deconstruct what they're talking about and ask, are they talking about separation of powers or are they just talking about administration being inefficient? So that leads me to this week's discussion. Um, what I really want you to do is talk about this idea that executive power has become more um, more noticed, right? Since, since the founding of the Constitution, it has occurred that the presidency has become a much more powerful branch. So the question is, how do you think Wil Hamilton and Madison, along with Jefferson and Wilson, would respond to the strengthening of the presidency through a creation of this administration, administrative apparatus? So think about this question. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing your discussion. Thanks very much.